a couple of weeks ago, <clears throat> I mentioned Canadian singer-songwriter Bruce Colburn in my message, and I lamented that I had, a number of years ago, read his memoir, Rumors of Glory, and I was disappointed because I, I couldn't recognize my faith in anything that he had to say about Christianity. And um, I, I also mentioned in my message that uh, I'm not his judge. He and God will get things all squared away in due time. Well, as uh, providence would have it, a few days later, I was reading at the Christianity Today website, and they noted that just recently, after a, about a 40-year hiatus from church, uh, Bruce Coburn is back. So <laughs> Bruce is back. Praise be to God. For those of you who know who Bruce Coburn is. <clears throat> We're in 1 John today, 1 John 2, and while preparing this message, I kept asking myself, what is the author talking about? What is John saying? And the more that I thought about that, mused and reflected, I found myself coming back to the theme of the children of God and being children of God. John is talking about the implications and the privileges of being in God's family. It's always nice to know that uh, you're on the right track, and I kind of thought I got some confirmation. I was uh, rifling through a, a file that I have on 1 John, and over the years I've tossed things there that I thought mon one day might be helpful. And lo and behold, I came across a paper that Wayne Tomalty uh, who grew up here and for many years was president of Mount Carmel. But when he was in seminary, he wrote a, ch uh, a paper on this passage that I'm going to be speaking about today. And I was delighted to read what he had to say in the opening pages. He said, this section that we are dealing with introduces the concept of the believer being a child of God. And when I read that, I cheered and I said, way to go, Wayne. Uh, you and I are on the same page. So I thought that was pretty cool. Well, this morning I'd like to explore with you the implications and privileges of being children of God. So let's begin by reading our passage, 1 John chapter 2, verse, verses 28 uh, to chapter 3, verse 10. I'm reading from the NIV 11. And now, dear children, continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. Chapter 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be, he has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. For... Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin. Because God's seed remains in them, they cannot go on sinning, because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Whoa, we're going to talk through that in 30 minutes. That's quite a mouthful. Well, implications and privileges. One, the first implication of being children of God is that 
done well, lived well, it prepares us for Jesus' coming. Verse 28. How should children of God live? John answers this question when he writes, and now, dear children, continue in him. In other words, be faithful to your father, God. The privilege of being family carries with it the responsibility of being faithful. The privilege of being family carries with it the responsibility of being faithful, right? Children who honor their parents stand out. My brother visits our aging mother twice a week. He mainly sits with her. Sometimes other siblings zoom in for the, for the visit, although there's not much visiting anymore. He mainly sits with her, holds her hand, and offers her the gift of presence. But his faithfulness is noted. Boy, I'll tell you, the staff note it. They've mentioned to him that they have a number of residents who don't get any visitors at all. And so his presence is noted. His faithfulness is noted. He does it as a son for his mother. What good is faithfulness, you say? John goes on to say that our faithfulness to our Heavenly Father will stand us in good stand when Jesus comes. Why? Notice what he says. So that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. When Jesus comes, one of the things he will do is review and reward the faithfulness of his children. Their faithfulness will be noted. And I take it that this reward is something in addition to salvation. Listen to how St. Paul spells it out in 2 Corinthians 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. How embarrassing, even frightening, to be caught in some sinful, selfish act when Jesus returns. Ever been caught in the act? I have. When I was five or six years old, a friend of mine and I engaged in some shoplifting. We'd walk to the corner store. Just inside the door was a crate of empty pop bottles, and we'd help ourselves to a few, walk up to the counter, collect the deposit from them, and then reinvest it in the store in candy. We thought we were so clever until the owner caught us. He apprehended us. He came out of nowhere. He just appeared. And I imagine that when Jesus comes, there are going to be a whole lot of people who weren't necessarily ready for it or expecting it. I'm thinking, we don't want to be misbehaving when Jesus comes. Far better to be faithful. It will save us the embarrassment. So John says, live well every day as a child of God. Two. Another implication of being children of God. It entails imitation. Verse 29. John begins by reminding his re readers what God is like. He says, he is righteous. And this basic trait of righteousness is suggestive of how we ought to conduct ourselves. If it's true that God is good and righteous altogether, what ought we to expect from his children? Much the same. We sometimes say, like father... Like father, like son. A chip off the old block, right? Well, the common Christian conviction, John says, is that the offspring of God, those who are truly God-begotten, will reflect a family resemblance. There was a man who used to attend the chapel. His name was Ralph Tomalty. Some of you will remember him. After he passed away, I started seeing Ralph. I had these Ralph sightings whenever I was around his sons, Keith, Neil, or Wayne. I saw Ralph in his children. There was this family resemblance. Well, this is another implication of being children of God. We best represent him when we are like him, acting like him, imitating him, being upright. Make sense? Three, another implication of being children of God is that it has its privileges. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. 
There are several. First, there is a present peace. Later on, we'll talk about a future peace. And then there's thirdly, an overlapping peace. But first, there's a present peace, verse one. We don't have to wait to enter into God's family. It's true now. We can enjoy the status of being children of God in real time. Imagine a foster child who's been placed in a good home after being in some not so good homes. But now they're in a good home and the child is loved and cared for. Everybody agrees that it's a good fit. The adoption paperwork has been submitted and now it's just a matter of time until it's final. But the waiting, oh, the waiting, it's agonizing. The foster child fears they'll wake up and discover it's all a dream. They want this so badly. That is not what it's like being God's children. For the Christian, there is no waiting. The waiting is over. It's a done deal. We're family now. John seems pretty pumped about this. Being God's children, he says, is a sign of God's love lavished on us. God has outdone himself. He's pulled out all the stops. He loves us. He's for us. That's good news. Of course, he goes on to note that the world, or to to render it maybe the way John would like us to, the world ganged up against God, doesn't get it, he says. They don't get how lucky we are because if they did, they would want in on this marvelous family relationship. So being God's children is a present reality. There's another privilege. Verse two, we'll call this the future peace. One of the intriguing things about Christian salvation is the tug and tension we feel. We know that God has a marvelous future prepared for us, right? And some of it we already have, right? But some of it is still to come. Our reclamation, our redemption has begun, but it's not yet fully done. It's both already and not yet. Already and not yet. Do you ever feel that? Do you ever feel the tug and the tension of that? Well, this is why John said, dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. Do you sense the two elements of something present as well as something future? John continues, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. A day is coming when God's restoration of all that sin ruined will be complete, including ourselves. I think if we could give St. Paul a moment to elaborate on the future renewal of God's children, he'd say, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body, Philippians 3. This is another one of the privileges of God's children, a future hope. But there's more. Verse 3, there's an overlapping piece. This one is difficult. It's difficult to describe because it entails some overlap, an overlap rather, between the present and the future. Something unusual is going on. Presently, we're God's children. Later on, what God started at conversion, our reclamation, will be brought to full completion. But lest we think all that we can do now is hang on for the future, John announces the good news that the future is making its way back into the present. Listen to what he says. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. How to illustrate this? I had to rack my brains a bit. Reminds me of an engaged couple. He's already popped the question. She has said yes. There's a ring on her finger, a pledge the guy intends to keep. But the wedding is still a month away. Some of you remember that? The wedding was still a month away but they're so excited. Life is good. For sure they wish it was today, but they're so committed to each other that they wouldn't think 
of getting involved with a third party. They anticipate the sweetness of what is to come and it inspires them to live well, to be pure right now while they're waiting for the big day. John says the future is working its way back into the present. If we have a share in the Christian hope and all God's children do, then God's work of saving, rescuing, redeeming, renewing, restoring is underway. You might think of it as a foretaste of what is to come. Call it good news. It's already happening. There's overlap. If we could give the microphone to St. Paul one more time, I think he might put it like this from 2 Corinthians. Therefore, do not lose heart. Though outwardly, that is physically, we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. In other words, the transformation has begun. You feel that way sometimes? You look in the mirror, somebody gives you some feedback about good things they see in your life, and it's like, you know, I could almost believe the transformation is already happening. This is good. Still have a long way to go, but it's good to know it's here, it started. Well, these are some of the privileges of God's children. We're presently children of God. We're, assu- we're assured that God will finish what he's begun. God is bound and determined to do that, and he finishes what he starts, and we're getting a foretaste of the future now. Which brings us to four. <clears throat> kind of wish the passage ended there, but we've still got a few more verses A final implication of being children of God is that it brings us into a life, and I wasn't sure how to finish the sentence. It brings us into a life which, according to John, and my first stab at it was, is a life of lessening sin, and I think that's true, but I don't think that's what he's talking about. It brings us into a life, I'm going to go with against sin. Sin, verses 4 to 10, against sin. Let's try to unravel that a bit. This section is difficult. It's, sec- it's difficult because if we translate it in a fairly straightforward manner, which I like to do, it seems to say something like, none of us sin. If you've read through that passage, especially in an older translation, at first read, it sounds like John is saying we don't sin. And the translators of the NIV have done a few things to sort of soften that. I don't necessarily agree with it, but that's what they've done. It, it, it's, it's almost like, at first read, the passage is saying uh, that children of God don't sin. Well, wouldn't that be nice? Let's look at just two verses in particular, verses 6 and verses 9. Let me read it to you first from the New King James Version. Verse 6, whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Perfectly acceptable translation. Verse 9. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Have you noticed those verses before? You wondered about them? I like the New King James translation as well as the RSV. Uh, the Coleman Standard Bible as well. Um, I like those translations better than the NIV, the ESV, or the NLT in this verse. And I say that because I think it's a more faithful rendering of the original. And I also think it's more consistent with John's style of writing. Like, he drives us crazy sometimes. He is so black and white. There's not as much gray with John as there is with some other writers. There is a little bit of gray, but there's not. Not much. It's black and white. So it really suits the way that uh, he tends to describe the Christian life. The NIV's rendering, I think, softens the offensiveness of the more straightforward reading of the New King James. Let let me read it to you now in the uh, NIV. Verse 6, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. It's not quite the same idea, is it? No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Verse 9. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. 
See how it makes the text seem, I would say, more realistic. And on one level, I would say it's true. What the NIV is conveying is true. I just don't think that's the point that John is trying to make here. You might say, well, Terry, if we go with a more straightforward rendering, won't we end up believing something like sinless perfection? Have you ever met anybody who believed that in this life, if you chalked up the right number of high-level spiritual experiences, you could get to a point where you didn't sin? Do you know there are people in North America who believe that? I just finished reading the biography of, uh, or the memoir of Philip Yancey. Diana and I read it. His mother believed that, and she taught that to her two sons. Now, uh, Philip didn't embrace that idea, but this is a concern and because there are some people who believe it. I don't think we should believe in sinless perfection because John doesn't. In chapters 1 and 2, John makes it pretty clear that true believers don't deny their sin. Remember he said what believers do with their sin? If we confess our sins. John believed that believers struggle with sin, and one of the things we should do with it is that we should confess it. So he obviously didn't believe in sinless perfection. Secondly, I think personal experience suggests that uh, this isn't the case. If you're ever tempted to believe that you've you've hit this wonderful plateau of sinless perfection and you're married, just check with your spouse (laughs) or your children and they will set the record straight. I'm sure that we could agree that sinlessness in this life is a great goal, but it's, it's at the same time a pipe dream. I'm reminded of the quote of Vince Lombardi, the famous football coach, who used to tell his players at the beginning of the season, gentlemen, we are going to relentlessly chase perfection, knowing full well we will not catch it, because nothing is perfect. But we are going to relentlessly chase it, because in the process, we will catch excellence. And I think he gets the right idea. So by all means, God enabling, shoot for perfect righteousness, And in the process, you may catch godliness. So what does John mean when he says, a true believer doesn't sin? I think that's what he's saying. What does he mean by what he's saying? That's another matter. I think what John is saying is that conversion to Christianity brings us under a new regime. It brings us under the regime of God. And in this regime, sin isn't allowed. In God's family, we don't do that. Not that it never happens, but it's not supposed to. An example. Those of you who know Diane and I, you've visited us in our home. Not lately, I guess, but you've visited us in our home. You'll recall that one of our house rules is we don't wear outdoor shoes indoors. If you have indoor shoes, by all means, bring them along, and we would just ask that you slip off your outdoor shoes, put on your indoor shoes, and then come on in and enjoy our place. You could say that wearing outdoor shoes in our home, it's not done. That doesn't mean it's not possible to do, but it's frowned on. It's not permitted. We don't do that sort of thing here. I think that's what John is saying. It's like that with sin in God's family. We don't do that. Well, let's not miss the larger point. John is answering a question something like, how do we distinguish between two groups of people? You've got the devil's own, and then you've got God's own. That seems to be the larger theme in in this section here. Um, It has to do, John says, with family resemblance. The devil's own take after their father, the devil. God's own take after their father, God, who is righteous. Which brings us to the question, do we? Do we take after our father, God, who is righteous? When people associate with us, are they struck by the family resemblance between us and God? When people observe how we've conducted ourselves the past while, do they comment on our graciousness, our kindness, and our patience with one another? 
Being children of God has great privileges and great responsibilities. And I don't know about you, but I find it quite overwhelming. Let's prepare for communion. As we do that, I'm reminded of a news story from last week. A Montreal firefighter by the name of Pierre Lacroix drowned on the St. Lawrence River. Did you catch that story? He drowned. He was trying to rescue several people who were in danger in rapids. And the line in the story that caught my eye was, he lost his life saving people. That's what they said. He lost his life saving people, which reminds us of Jesus, who also died saving people, sinners, us. We too were in imminent danger, but thanks to his courageous self-sacrifice, we've been saved. So thank God for firefighters like Pierre Lacroix, and especially thank God for our Savior, Jesus Christ, who we remember today in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup. Holy Father, we are moved by stories of sacrifice and heroism. It boggles the imagination to think that the Son of God would put himself in harm's way on our behalf. We who dismissed him, who failed to recognize him, can now share in the deliverance he won. Such mercy and grace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. So let's take the bread, the sign of his body given for us. And then let's take the cup, the sign of his blood shed for us. So we like to send you home with some mini assignments in the form of, uh, well, some of them are questions, not all of them are. And these will have to do with... um, Uh, implications and privileges of being children of God. So the first uh, uh, statement is, ask someone who knows you to identify family resemblances marking you as family of God, as as a child of God, rather. What is it about my life that might suggest that I am a child of God? And then secondly, What are some sins or bad habits you're currently working to eliminate from your life? And then thirdly, if you could ask the author of this passage any question, what would it be? Our benediction is taken from 2 Corinthians. If you would please stand, I'd like to give it to you and I'm hoping that you will receive it. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. Go in peace.